The sun came out again and again and again. Its days as a nourisher of fields and a provider of light had come and gone. Now the giant red ball served as a singular grain of sand in the hourglass. And every time it fell, it took a little bit of the earth with it. It had become too strong. We had become too weak. The people needed a solution. At first they put their hope in the champions of industry. Surely those that initiated these atmospheric horrors that gripped the world had the keys to deactivate it as well. But unfortunately, human technology has proven itself time and time again to be a series of Frankenstein's monsters. Control had been an illusion all along. Creation, unfortunately, had not. Yubo was a shit city. It was settled 200 years ago by horny prospectors that were so desperate for a future that they crafted a continuum of culture out of resource exploitation. And in this era of history, that was the original sin to coax the gullible out of their squalor only to wind up in more squalor miles away from their family. And all they had to do was to set into motion a machine that burned everything for fuel. Many died without a whisper in lands foreign to them or were swindled out of what little they found by business interests. Amalgams of greed, these fledgling corporations answered only to the human drive for more. The worst part is, although they seem larger in life in the moment, they couldn't ever conceive of their future scale in their most perverse dreams. While these companies couldn't fix the problem they created, they were able to sell the people a solution. The solar diffuser was ingenious. It was simple, easy to produce, and didn't require the people to change their lifestyles. Cars could keep idling in drive throughs recycling could continue half-acidly, and gender reveal parties could destroy acres of land unabated. What it was, was essentially a giant sunglasses lens that was attached to a 40-foot articulated arm that moved with the sun as it rose and set. This allowed light to filter through and essentially take the new and dangerous edge off of the direct sunlight. The technology also allowed for the lens to turn crystal clear in the case of a cloudy day. It was able to ship in just three pieces. Across the river sat Marysville. Conventional wisdom stated that Marysville was founded by the people that couldn't hack it at gold prospecting. But people in Marysville told each other the same thing about Yuba. Plus, their name sounded funny. They were both small towns, the size of which its inhabitants had nothing better to do than to look across the river at their neighbors and fixate on their few subtle differences. Mayor Goldfinch was a popular and charmingly blunderous man. He was elected without the questionable credibility of being a lifelong resident, and actually came from one of the larger, more affluent cities that people in Yuba despised. It's always been regarded among the politically savvy as a quality of above average intelligence to be able to read a room and tell people what they want to hear. But Goldfinch was proof that this piece of conventional wisdom had no legs. Certainly the people of Yuba had sniffed out and elected someone spiritually aligned with them. He was a good leader because he did not look down on the people of the city as rubes, but rather mixed among them as brethren. The cadre of influential Yubans gathered around the television at the bar one tense evening. The federal government was issuing a statement that had been intensely anticipated. The ozone was in its death throes, and the last few tissue paper thin layers of it were about to dissipate. There was no fixed timeline for this to happen, but the official assured the public that it would be no longer than a couple of weeks. Due to the scale of the problem, the feds were unable to help and directed the public to retreat to their private shelters or at least submerge school buses and other public transit vehicles in the earth. The kind of people in Yuba were not the kind of people to have private shelters. Not only would the heat be immense, the government spokesperson said, but he went on to explain that the destructive solar rays that would intermittently blast through to the earth could combust whatever it shone upon. We must stare destiny in the face while looking to the future, the man said just before the mayor turned the screen off. The Sheriff Harksel, Mark the assistant manager of the grocery store, Sherry the owner of the gas station, and Auto Dialer Dennis all exchanged glances and then looked to Mayor Goldfinch. The sheriff broke the silence. Well, why don't we get one of those solar diffuser things that be, seem to be popping up all over? Goldfinch exhaled patiently. He responded, There's not enough in the city budget to buy as many as we'd need. Our town would need at least three. 
Sherry cut in. I can't believe he suggested we bury school buses. They're so short on ideas that the best they could come up with is dig a fucking hole and fill it with fucking school buses. Well, what are our alternatives then? Asked Mark. So we're broke. There's no shade trees worth mentioning for miles in all directions, and the river's about to dry up, so do we just die here? Goldfinch shifted in his near-broken bar stool. Well, we're not totally broke. His thought trundled off into the quiet of hoping no follow-up questions occurred. He was not a smart man, but he did know how the next few minutes of the conversation would play out. So we're not broke then. Okay, how not broke are we? Sherry asked pointedly. All eyes turned to Goldfinch. Well, technically speaking, we do have enough in the city's general fund for one solar diffuser. Quiet. Quiet was a sound of everybody's expectations lowering. And in each of their bent imaginations, some of their neighbors would suffer and die for the bloody logic that dictated that the needs of these few outweigh the needs of the many. To consider suffering is for those in front of the barrel of a gun, not for those behind the trigger. Well, auto dialer Dennis was the first to speak. He'd made his money through telefraud, but his real skill was in not having been picked up by state or federal agents. The nickname was Sarcastic Hostility, but he didn't mind, he kept it. Auto dialer Dennis drawled on with slow measure. Well, I guess we get the one. Sheriff Harksell brought up that he could corral the citizenry to the center of town in an effort to save as many lives as possible by putting them under the shade of the one diffuser. All right, started Goldfinch. He pulled up the website. It says here to install it on the highest hill or tallest structure. Mark cut in, equal parts of panic and excitement. Oh, this town is flat as hell. Maybe we could just attach it to the tower on top of the television station next to City Hall? From there, it could just do its thing and keep us safe, I guess? Goldfinch continued. I'll put in the order. They say it comes on three trucks. The lens is in two pieces and the arms on the third. There's no word about how it gets installed or how long that takes, though. Auto dialer Dennis offered to wrangle the most technologically and mechanically minded people in town for an installation posse. For a moment, things seemed like they'd work out somehow. The mayor, a hunt and peck typist, slowly entered the information into the form. And Jerry Craig, the bartender, who had been listening intently, kept idly wiping the same glass over and over throughout the meeting. He made no effort to conceal his observing these revelations. He had even managed to copy down the Byzantine tracking number from over Goldfinch's shoulder. Once his shift was over, he went home to Marysville, where they couldn't afford even one solar diffuser. Jerry Craig quickly sought out Marysville's Pillars of Society and hatched a plan. Their idea was to place a fake call to get the sheriff out of town once the solar diffuser trucks were about an hour or so out. Then, his people would block the road and divert the deliveries into Marysville before they were able to cross the river into Yuba. Jerry Craig thought himself very smart at the end of the day. However, there were two things he did not know. The solar diffuser delivery drivers were highly unreliable and auto dialer Dennis was banging his school-aged daughter Dawn in secret. On the day of the delivery, Sheriff Harksell got the phony call but noticed the many procedural errors in it. It stank something awful, but his curiosity compelled him to swing out and just take a look at this domestic disturbance. He drove out past the river and past Marysville. He wouldn't be back until dark. Jerry Craig smelled the hot, dry wind blow past him that evening. Somewhere in the distance, a rice paddy burned or maybe a thicket of trees. The smoke that the wind carried was thick, was robust with misery. If he didn't execute his plan perfectly, some other forgotten town down the line would be getting microscopic particles of his burned home in the nostrils of their people portending their doom. His conscience was clear. By degrees, survival implies that something that's not you dies, he reminded himself. And his neighbors across the river were just fine with saving themselves and not sparing a single thought for Marysville. He gripped the handle of his pocket-bound pistol tight with bitter resolve. Jerry Craig's people had set up some road closure signs along the highway to divert the trucks to Marysville, where they would be set upon by his armed buddies and then they'd take care of the driver. He and his party would grab the diffuser off the trucks, set it up, 
and Yuba would look upon them in dumbfounded amazement. How the hell did they do it, they would ask. Jerry Craig chuckled to himself at this thought. Night fell with a painful slowness, seeming as if it took more effort than ever to get the day to yield. Eventually all was dark, and Jerry Craig checked his phone. The truck was pinged just 15 miles south and was headed straight for Marysville. He lit the road flares. As he did, he noticed a pair of headlights down the road. He pulled back the slide on his pistol, loading a bullet into the chamber, returned it to his pocket. Hopefully he didn't come to this. He didn't think himself a violent man, but he was certainly a desperate one tonight. As the lights came closer, he could see that they didn't belong to a truck at all. He loosened his grip on the gun. Worse still, he could see that it was a car belonging to the sheriff's department. He slowed in front of the handmade road closed signs and pushed past them cautiously. The car then pulled a U-turn back to where the signs were set and stopped. Harksel got out and radioed the station asking what the hell was going on. As soon as he placed that call, he started to connect the suspicious road closure and the puzzling call that brought him out of town for most of the day. Jerry Craig emerged from the bush on the other side of the road. Harksel heard him coming and shone his car spotlight on him. Jerry Craig, what the hell are you doing out here? Do you have anything to do with this? And he was cut off by the thunderous arrival of the first truck. The driver quickly regarded the makeshift closure signs and the men in the road and responsibly off-ramped toward Marysville. Once the truck turned away, the light that was on Jerry Craig briefly lit the side of the truck. It was a solar diffuser delivery vehicle. It was carrying part of Yuba's solar diffuser. He turned back toward Jerry Craig with a look of angry inquisition so powerful that it carried through the dark blanket of night. The sheriff was about to start asking questions again, but the bartender answered with two quick, unaimed hip shots. Crouching behind his car, Harksel's equally impulsive return fire was drowned out by the arrival of another truck, and it came on fast, blowing its horn. Rushing out from behind his cover, Harksel waved at the truck to keep it from pulling off toward Marysville like the last one. He was making as big of gestures as he could, waving the truck through as if he were lobbing a heavy melon in the direction of Yuba with his gun hand. Jerry Craig loosed another two shots, and one clipped the sheriff on the right shoulder, the shock of which caused him to squeeze off around from his own gun. Harksel's bullet struck the windshield of the oncoming truck he was trying to divert. Glass shattered into the driver's face, and the truck careened off the road and proceeded to tumble into a drainage ditch and roll like a wind-blown candy wrapper. Once it was done rolling, the truck loosed a guttural hiss, a death sigh. When the sheriff looked back to find the bartender, he was gone. Clumsy footprints headed off toward Marysville. He wouldn't be hard to find later. Harksel then went to investigate the truck, but doubled back just before doing so to remove the phony road signs. Jogging down to the crashed truck, he found the trailer on its side, the bloody driver motionless, and the loading door ajar with an aluminum arm hanging grotesquely out of the back. Bent and twisted, it was absolutely unsalvageable. The sheriff camped by his car to make sure the third and final truck made its way to Yuba. Just before sunrise, it did. One half of the solar diffuser lens was in their possession, and one half went to Marysville. The arm went to no one. This half-moon-shaped shield was their only lifeline. Suddenly the world seemed tenuous. Nature was taking back what was its. The roadside gravel crunched rebelliously under his tires as his car headed back to town and an uncertain morning. Harksel was the first person from Yuba to see the broken arm of the solar diffuser there on the side of the road, and thus he was also the first one to understand that for now, life would demand a new evolution unto brutal old ways.